Okay, so let's take a closer look at the character of Almer and uh, you can jot down or highlight some of the key descriptions of his character. So in our very first paragraph we learn that uh, Almer is a man of scientist, uh, science. He is an eminent proficient in every branch of natural philosophy and again he seems to be preoccupied with again uncovering a lot of the mysteries of the natural world and he works in his laboratory and has an assistant. We also know that he is newly married so uh, he again has devoted himself to science but he also has a young wife who he's fallen in love with and has married. Um, so again he has two passions in life, his love of science and uh, his new wife. So we learn uh, very quickly that right after their marriage he remarks to Georgiana that um, possibly she should have this birthmark on her cheek removed. So he becomes uh, obsessed with this idea that his wife should remove this, phys or this physical defect on her face, this birthmark, and he longs for her to be uh, a, a sort of an ideal vision of perfection. And he says to her, No, dearest Georgiana, you came so nearly perfect from the hand of nature that the slightest possible defect, which we hesitate whether to term a defect or a beauty, shocks me as being the visible mark of earthly perfect imperfection. So again, he notices the birthmark, and then he says it shocks him because it is a visible mark of her earthly imperfection. So if she didn't have this birthmark, he's sort of implying that she would be a perfect creature. So he's longing for this type of ideal, this perfection that does not exist in the world. And unfortunately, Georgiana uh, is the one who sort of, he's trying to heighten her beauty and uh, sort of obsessively fixates on this one little flaw on her cheek. Elmer's physical features, uh, he's described as pale, slender, and um, again he works within this laboratory environment. He's a sort of stark contrast with his assistant Aminadab, right? Uh, so Elmer again seems to be embodying a lot of the sort of higher thinking, uh, higher thoughts, uh, that are associated with a man of science. So he has sort of science or spiritual lofty goals for his science. He wants to achieve great things, but he's also sort of tainted by his failures. He has this large uh, book uh, journal of all his scientific experiments that his wife will find later on when she discovers. Uh, inside his laboratory that he has kept all these uh, documents of his experiments. Uh, so he has very sort of high ambitious goals and he tries to uh, conquer nature, the natural world, through his scientific experiments. Most often they are minor successes but mostly failures. So he doesn't ever come close to achieving this perfection that he longs for. I would also say that Almer is reminiscent of Victor Frankenstein. So if you're familiar with Frankenstein, you know Almer is also a young man driven by ambition and this uh, idea of trying to sort of conquer the natural world. Um, he has this flaw. His flaw would be sort of hubris or excessive ambition. We'll talk about this idea of playing God, but he is trying to control nature and in this case achieve perfection in nature or uh, human nature, physical, uh, Georgiana's physical features. So he again has too much pride or too much ambition and in this way he's also sort of an archetypal mad scientist figure, right? He takes his science too far to the brink of being immoral or unethical and again it becomes an obsession uh, where he again 
puts aside all sense of right and wrong by experimenting with his wife's life and compromising her own life in pursuit of his success. So it seems as if he values science, his passion for science, more than he values his wife's life. Georgiana is, again, Elmer's young, beautiful wife, and she is admired for her beauty. So Elmer, again, falls in love with her because she is uh, very sort of kind, sensitive, devoted, and beautiful. And she would be a physically perfect if she did not have this one little... Uh, mark on the side of her face, on her cheek, and in even sort of some men, um, it sort of is a contrast between Almer's perception of this birthmark and how other people view it. Uh, so at the bottom of page one we get an explanation of Georgiana's uh, physical appearance. So at the center of Georgiana's left cheek, there was a singular mark, deeply interwoven, as it were, with the texture and substance of her face. So this mark, again, goes deep within. It's not just a surface mark, right? It's attached to her sort of very life spirit. And then when she blushed or had sort of more excitement, there was a rush of blood and her whole cheek was bathed in this brilliant glow, a crimson color, and the mark was sort of removed. You couldn't see it so much, but most of the time uh, when she was sort of pale, there was the birthmark very distinct on her cheek. So the story makes the note that some uh, men who were courting Georgiana, they saw this birthmark as something beautiful and even magical and they long to just, uh, again, press their lips against this little birthmark on her cheek. And then it contrasts these men who uh, sort of saw this as a beauty mark with men like Almer, who, again, maybe it didn't bother them at first, but they start wishing that it was not there because uh, Georgiana is so beautiful. She's so close to being an ideal uh, vision of female perfection that... They just wish she didn't have this one little mark, uh, otherwise she would be physically perfect. And then we have Almer being one of these men who again, it didn't bother him before they were married, but as soon as they were married he sort of started, it started bothering him more and it becomes more and more of an obsession to him. And as soon as she realizes Almer is sort of repulsed by her birthmark, Georgiana also becomes obsessed with removing it from her face. So she st starts to sort of internalize Almer's hatred, repulsion, disgust for this little birthmark. And she, as much as he does, wants it removed at any cost to her life. So she, again, implores her husband to take any risk involved and sort of use his scientific knowledge in order to remove this birthmark from her cheek. She's very self-sacrificing in terms of her uh, symbolic qualities and again she seems to represent a higher sort of moral level, uh, sort of spiritual love that she sort of seems to love Almer unconditionally and will do anything for him, even sacrificing her life. So she's very devo devoted and loyal and unfortunately becomes a sort of victim of her husband's ambition, his hubris of playing God, and her life is lost in this uh, scientific experiment. And then we have the character of Aminadab, and he, I have this picture here of an Igor figure, right? So we all know that in some versions of uh, Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein had this sort of low-statured uh, assistant in the laboratory, and that's where Aminadab seems to be sort of drawing from that same archetypal figure. And he's a stark contrast to Almer, right? So Almer's slender, pale, 
and he's all about sort of higher thought, higher thinking, and in, in contrast we have the character of Aminadab, who seems to represent man's physical nature, the material world. He's more of a brute. He's repeatedly um, referred to as a brute or an underworker. Uh, and again, um, his descriptions are sort of uh, reveal how he is a allegorical character. So I'll just read you a passage here. So forthwith there issued from an inner apartment a man of low stature, but bulky frame, with shaggy hair hanging about his visage, which was grimed with the vapors of the furnace. This personage had been Almer's underworker during his whole scientific career, and was admirably fitted for that office by his great mechanical readiness and the skill with which, while capable, incapable of comprehending a single principle, he executed all the details of his master's experiments. With his vast strength, his shaggy hair, his smoky aspect, and the indescribable earthiness that encrusted him, he seemed to represent man's physical nature. While Almer's slender figure and pale intellectual face were no less apt a type of the spiritual element. So these two characters are again are, are sort of allegorically representing different parts of human nature. Um, Amidadab is the more physical part of man's nature, Repre represents sort of the physical body um, and everything related to man's na physical nature. Almer is a sort of representation of the higher spiritual, intellectual, higher thought, uh, so the brain rather than the body. And these two figures are again starkly contrasting with one another and then we have Georgiana in the middle who again is very close to physically perfect except this one little uh, flaw on her cheek that again uh, instills such vehement um, anger and repulsiveness in Almer, her husband. So the birthmark itself is again very important in this story. It's the title of the story and it gives us a hint of the underlining themes or ideas that Hawthorne is trying to put forth. So the birthmark is definitely a central symbol in the story. Um, so when we look at the descriptions of this symbol we get some interesting details. So the little mark, right, is a color. It is a deeper crimson and uh, so it, we know it's red the color of a crimson stain upon the snow. So on Georgiana's cheek, which is as pale as snow, we have this bright red or deep red stain that's in the shape of a uh, human hand on her cheek. And then we get more descriptions. So, um, so in this little mark on her cheek, Almer, deems this as most disturbing and fears it even. He says its shape bore not a little similarity to the human hand, though of the smallest pygmy size. So it's a tiny little human hand on there. And then Almer, uh, it becomes so obsessed with this mark that again he is willing to risk his wife's life. Um, seeing her otherwise so perfect, he found this one defect grow more and more intolerable with every moment of their united lives. It was the fatal flaw of humanity which nature in one shape or another stamps ineffaceably on all her productions, either to imply that they are temporary and finite or that their perfection must be wrought by toil and pain. The crimson hand expressed the ineludable grip in which immortality mortality clutches the highest and purest of earthly mold degrading them into kindred with the lowest and even with the very brutes, like whom their visible frames return to dust. In this manner, selecting it as the symbol of his wife's liability to sin, sorrow, decay, and death, Almer's somber imagination was not long in regarding the birthmark a frightful object, causing him more trouble and horror than ever Georgiana's beauty, whether of soul or sense, had given him delight.